Well, hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to OLC TV for some more Total War Three Kingdoms. This time we're looking at the real battle tactics of the Battle of Bor Ma, specifically Guan Yu and the direct approach. So in the last episode we had a look uh, at the Battle of Anjong, where Cao Cao had constructed or made use of geographical uh, abnormal, uh, abnormalities to create a hiding position for his troops suckered the enemy into an ambush by leading a ragtag group of troops and a baggage train looking like they were panicking and his elite troops came out from behind this earth road and smashed Jiangxiu and Liu Biao's armies. This is a very different type of battle. Um, there is no greater tactics involved in the battle itself, though there is a grander strategy at play here which I will touch on, though not in a huge amount of detail because this is part of the Greater Guandu campaign and I'm only going to be introducing the beginning of this campaign. So, the situation at the time. Gongsun Zan has been defeated and Yuan Shao is now back down at Ye, having uh, pacified a chunk of the north. He by no means had complete control. There are a lot of new warlords, people like Tian Chou, people like Xiang Fu, Yan Rou, up there, as well as the Wu Huan, who had a loose allegiance with uh, Yuan Shao, but it wasn't uh, anything formal, per se. His son, Yuan Tan, held Qing province, which is mostly uh, to the east south of the Yellow River, but he also had a couple of footholds north of the Yellow River as well. Uh, the Black Mountain bandits were in the Black Mountain, unsurprisingly, um, and were continuing to raid Yuan Shao and were at this stage uh, nominal allies of Cao Cao. Though again, it wasn't particularly formal. Uh, Jiang Yan had received a formal imperial uh, position, but um, you know, they were still very much bandits. Cao Cao had managed to defeat Yuan Shu. He'd defeated uh, Liu Bei. In defeating Liu Bei, uh, Liu Bei had fled to Yuan Shao and Guan Yu had been captured. So Guan Yu was now with Cao Cao, working for Cao Cao. Uh, Luoyang was defended by a couple of uh, very talented generals and also uh, guarding a ford that would cross towards Luoyang was um Shahu Dun. Okay? That's the current position. Now, Yuan Shao has always been criticized for the approach he took to attack Cao Cao. It's a very, very direct attack, like straight down going straight for Shu. But he was actually more boxed in than people uh, think at this time. Cao Cao had been running for a few years this campaign of sort of encircling uh Yuan Shao. He had contacts with Xiang Yufu and Yan Rou, who were both supporting him at this time and would later become two formal generals under his control. Um, he also was uh, making political gains across the Yellow River in Henei, um, and he had placed Wei Chong um, as administrator north of the river to hold the left flank. What he'd also done is uh, make a deal with the bandit Zhang Ba, and told Zhang Ba to go east, raid and conquer territory from Yuan Tan. So his right flank was completely secure. He also had uh, set up at Guandu one hell of a siege work. Um, big earthen walls, towers, massive fortification to defend the roads to Shu. So anyone who wants to attack his capital would have to go through Guandu. Slightly further north of Guandu, um, he had set up some defences as well, which we will now discuss. Um, Yuan Shao obviously started, when he felt that he was under pressure, started to move down south to attack Cao Cao. Now here, Cao Cao in response moves to Guangdu. Um, he already had along the Yellow River people like Chong Yu, Liu Yan and Yu Jin. Now Chong Yu was one of uh, Cao Cao's more famous strategists and commanders. Chong Yu was at Juan Chong. Um, Guarding the uh, east, um, of course, Zhang Ba was slightly further east, but uh, he needed someone who was actually directly under his control guarding the east. So Chong Yu was there, but Chong Yu only had 700 troops. Now Cao Cao did want to send more troops, another thousand troops, to Chong Yu to help defend, but Chong Yu wrote back and said, "Don't bother. Um, 700 troops, Yuan Shao won't realize I'm a threat. He won't think I'm a threat, and he'll walk straight by me." If you give me an extra thousand, you will attack, and 1700 troops are not enough to beat Yuan Shao's entire army, which was rumoured to be about 100 and 110,000 troops and cavalry together. Okay, so Cao Cao didn't send troops to Cheng Yu, and Cheng Yu was absolutely right. Yuan Shao completely ignored him. Um, there was Liu Yan, who was the administrator uh, 
of uh, Hone, I believe. Um, Tao Tao's appointed administrator, at least, in charge of the city at Boma, uh, or Baima, as some readings will call it. Um, Liu Yan was there with his troops, and he was guarding a bridgehead that could potentially be used by Yuan Shao's troops. There was also Yu Jin guarding Yan Ford. Now, Yu Jin's another one of Tao Tao's great uh, battlefield commanders, a lieutenant general at this time. And uh, Yu Jin was guarding the Ford, and Yu Jin had been there for a long time. He'd built a lot of ships, and they had been regularly crossing and raiding um, Yuan Shao's lands to the north of the Yellow River. Now, Yuan Shao had in his vanguard Yan Liang, who's one of his more uh, famous commanders. Yan Liang had about 10,000 soldiers with him, a mix of cavalry, infantry, and uh, archers, crossbows. And they advanced to Li Yang, and Li Yang was going to be the staging post for Yuan Shao's operations. Li Yang was one of the uh, Han Dynasty uh, military training grounds, um, used mostly by the Trans Liao army that uh, dealt with uh, sort of Xiongnu and, and, and those borders uh, around the uh, Xi He region, for example. Um, so he went there to act. Uh, to use that as a bridgehead, and from that position he started to attack Borma and had Borma under siege. Cao Cao was rushing north, thinking that Yuan Shao's entire army was going to come down there and he wanted to support it, but he was advised by Guo Jia as well as other strategists that perhaps they could sucker Yuan Shao into uh, being misdirected so that the siege at Borma could be lifted through other means. And this basically entailed Cao Cao splitting off a de uh, decoy force and sending them north of the Yellow River to, and this is a very large force, to make it look to Yuan Shao like there was a big attack coming to his rear. In response to this, Yuan Shao shifts over to match the decoy force. Cao Cao then, with uh, the likes of Zhang Liao um, and Guan Yu, take a light force of cavalry and infantry and rush off to lift the siege at Bo Ma. On Yuan Shao being suckered into deploying against the decoy force, the decoy force falls back towards Yu Jin, and they're all there, more support at Yan Ford. Yuan Shao is left looking like a fool. Cao Cao suddenly has Yan Liang completely cut off. Now this is an artistic representation of the battlefield. Please do not look at these troops and think this is exactly what they had. It is not. We don't know precisely what they had. All we know is Yan Liang had a relatively more balanced force because he was uh, planning to cross the river and lay siege. So it would have been slightly less cavalry, slightly more infantry. Liu Yan has his uh, defensive garrison that have been holding out now for quite a while. And Cao Cao had a light force of cavalry and infantry. It does not state that there were any archers there, uh, but there may well have been. Okay, They sometimes just refer to foot soldiers and that is literally anything on foot. Um, but whatever happens, uh, with the troop uh, variety, whatever happened with the troop variety doesn't really matter. What happened next is quite famous. Okay, so Cao Cao and his army advance towards Bo Ma. Now, normally, when Cao Cao fights his battles, he's trying to outthink the enemy, um, and he's already done that on a grand strategic scale. We're now looking at looking at it from a different general's perspective, because what Cao Cao does is he releases Zhang Liao. Guan Yu as the vanguard to operate separately from the main army. So they go further forward with their cavalry and their retinues. And Guan Yu and Zhang Liao, Zhang Liao is a renowned as one of the greatest generals of the time, very, very flexible thinker, came up with brilliant strategies to win battles. Guan Yu, the god of war, was a lot more direct in his warfare. He was a lot less of a lateral thinker than either Cao Cao or Zhang Liao. And so Guan Yu, on seeing Yan Liang's banner, leaves the main vanguard, rushes forth with his retinue, and chops Lian Liang's head off. This is typical of warfare at the time, where the majority of your troops were not necessarily wholly reliable. You had a force, uh, a regiment, let's say, and this regiment would be made up of uh, clansmen, loyal retainers, family members, and other conscripted or levied uh, soldiers into this force. Um, and you have occasional generals who are renowned for having particularly reliable versions of this. Uh, one example would be Dian Wei with his soldiers. 
uh, Xu Chu with the Tiger Warriors, uh, Gao Shun with his own Camp Crushers specific shock troops. Now, these guys were renowned for being very brave and for being able to do precisely what their commander wanted. And what this meant was, going into battle is a scary thing. Most men don't want to throw themselves into a situation where there's a high chance of being injured or killed. So they're going to hold back until the very last minute before they charge. A lot of the commanders were extraordinarily brave men. Um, and yeah, they would have had good armor and, and weaponry and training. Well, not necessarily training, actually, but um, they certainly would have had more experience than everything else. But they were a little bit mad in a lot of cases, um, and they would throw themselves into the fight. But one man on his own against 700 is going to end very badly. Um, so if they had around them a core of retainers who they could rely on, so if they put one step forward, the rest of their retainers would put one step forward, then they would be very, very successful. And there's a lot of examples in this period of one regiment, one man charging forward, being followed by his regiment and smashing an entire army apart. And this is an example of this. So Guan Yu rushed forward with his retainers only, beheaded Yan Liang, and that started the disintegration of Yan Liang's force. It's one group of very probably well-armored, uh, well-drilled, elite retainers with a brave, reliable, uh, very highly skilled general charging forward, executes the equivalent general on the enemy side, and suddenly the army starts to collapse around them. In response to Yan Liang being killed, Zhang Liao, now leading the bulk of the vanguard on his own, orders a full-on charge, and they charge forward to seize the initiative that Guan Yu has given them. And this leads to a lot of deaths and a breaking of the siege lines. Yan Liang's forces start to crumble, okay? Seeing the battle ahead, Cao Cao starts to rush forward to support. He knows his men are outnumbered. We don't know precisely what the figures are. We know that Yan Liang had about 10,000 men, uh, Cao Cao is only ever referred to as having less than Yuan Shao in all of these uh, battles. Um, so we can assume he had less, but how much less we don't know. But he rushes forward to support on his arrival. Uh, the likes of Guo Tu and Tan Yu Chong, who were other commanders of Yuan Shao's forces helping Yan Liang at this time, could not regain the order. And Yan Liang's troops had to flee back north of the river the bridgehead that they had built from Li Yang to Bo Ma was completely destroyed. Li, uh, Liu Yan was then saved by Cao Cao, and Bo Ma was at that stage considered no longer needed. So the aftermath of that battle. So Guan Yu had been captured by Cao Cao and had been treated very, very well. He was obviously looking for an opportunity to uh, repay Cao Cao's kindness before he left because he knew where Liu Bei was. Liu Bei was on Yuan Shao's staff at this time. Liu Bei would not have fought in the front lines against Cao Cao at this stage because Guan Yu was also a kind of hostage. So that would have forfeited Guan Yu's life. But on killing Yan Liang, who was one of Yuan Shao's more celebrated commanders, lifting the siege at Borma and basically causing a great rout of Yuan Shao's vanguard um, and defending the crossing, Guan Yu uh, can be assumed to have completed uh, a mission worthy of Cao Cao's favor. He had uh, then an opportunity to leave Cao Cao and rejoin Liu Bei. So that is pr pretty much exactly what happened. Uh, Cao Cao did spend a short time at Bormar, and we can assume it happened there, though we don't know exactly. And Guan Yu did leave to uh, rejoin Liu Bei at this stage before the Battle of Yan Ford, which follows this battle. Um, we know he must have left before the Battle of Yan Ford because Liu Bei was part of the Battle of Yan Ford and he would not have fought had Guan Yu still been under Cao Cao's control at this time. Uh, the whole escape of Guan Yu and everything else uh, is dreamt up by Lord Guanzhong in Remnants of the Three Kingdoms. It did not happen like that. Um, yeah. So uh, the aftermath immediately after this will be Guan Yu uh, being given permission to leave Cao Cao and return to Liu Bei, which he did. Uh, also, as I said, Bo Ma was considered to be slightly too far forward, undefensible, and so Cao Cao ordered that the civilians, the soldiers, 
all the baggage, all the supplies be loaded onto carts and marched back to uh, uh, Guandu. Uh, this then was seen by Yuan Shao as a retreat and Yuan Shao, instead of then being positioned at Liyang, after being defeated so heavily there, he shifts over to Yan Ford and he starts to make a push towards Yan Ford and we get the Battle of Yan Ford, which will be our next episode. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've enjoyed this quite brief look at the beginning of the Guandu campaign and also the Battle of Borma, and also a little bit of information about how armies fought uh, in this time. I know it's very, 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 very lightweight. If people do want to know more, please let me know, and I'll be more than happy to provide a more in-depth thing about army composition and how battle lines would have worked at this period of time. But I really hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. If you think that anyone would like any of these for information's sake, anyone who plays Total War Three Kingdoms or is an interest in uh, the Three Kingdoms era or just battles from different nations in general, please feel free to share this with them as well. But thank you very much for joining me, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.